Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, and I'm a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Initiatives at Johns Hopkins The Experts to discuss the war in Ukraine and its global consequences. Since that initial briefing, the conflict has continued unabated. For the past month, Russia's armed forces, having been frustrated in their attempt to seize Kyiv, have concentrated the bulk of their military efforts on the Donbas region of eastern Ukraine. The war's human toll has only grown worse. As we approach a grim milestone next Tuesday, May 24th, which will mark three months since the beginning of Russia's invasion, today's briefing offers an update on this ongoing crisis. I'm grateful to my four colleagues from across the university who are joining us today. Mary Surratt is the inaugural holder of the Marie Jose and Henry R. Kravis Distinguished Professorship of Historical Studies at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, or SICE, where she is a faculty member at the Henry A. Kissinger Center for Global Affairs. Mary's latest book, Not One Inch, is a thorough and engaging history of NATO's enlargement in the 1990s and is essential reading for understanding the evolution of NATO-Russia Russia relations in the post-Cold War era. Paul Spiegel is director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Humanitarian Health and a professor of the practice at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Paul is a physician by training and before joining the Bloomberg School, he served as deputy director and chief of public health at UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. In late April, Paul returned from Europe after more than six weeks on a World Health Organization surge team, where he served as emergency coordinator for the Ukrainian refugee crisis. Jessica Fanzo is an expert in the fields of diet, nutrition, and food security. She is the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Global Food Policy and Ethics at Johns Hopkins University and Vice Dean of Faculty Affairs at SICE. She also holds appointments in the Berman Institute of Bioethics and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Jess serves as the Director of Hopkins Global Food Policy and Ethics Program and as Director of Food and Nutrition Security at the Hopkins Alliance for a Healthier World. Nicholas Jabko is an associate professor of political science at the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. He is an expert on the European Union and European integration. He's the author of Playing the Market, a political strategy for uniting Europe, 1985 to 2005, which was published by Cornell University Press. And he is co-editor of the seventh volume of the State of the European Union series published by Oxford University Press. Prior to joining Johns Hopkins, Nicholas was a member of the research faculty at Sciences Po. Before I turn to each of our panelists for their initial thoughts, I want to remind our audience that we will be providing answers to your questions in real time today. So please submit your questions for our experts in the box at the bottom of your screen. When you do so, if possible, please include your organizational affiliation. We're going to begin with each of our panelists giving a brief overview of key topics, and then we'll move on to Q&A. Mary, I'm going to turn to you first. Can you please speak about the historical backstory of this war and offer some thoughts about what impacts the conflict is likely to have on international order? Certainly, and uh, honored to be here with you and my Hopkins colleagues, even if our topic today is a sad one. Yes, I am a historian by training, as you indicated, and I have actually for many years been working on a history of tensions between Americans, Europeans, and Russians. I had become very alarmed at the way that Russian President Vladimir Putin liked to mark anniversaries with violence. Also birthdays, for example, I, in, on October 7th, 2006, a human rights advocate whom he particularly despised, a brave woman named Anna Polakovskaya, who uncovered his crimes against humanity in Chechnya, uh, 
which is sadly a precursor to the current conflict. She was assassinated by a contract killer while bringing in her groceries, and Putin celebrated her death the next day as, as the passing of an extremely insignificant woman. Similarly, if you fast forward a decade, on October 7th, 2016, the Hillary Clinton campaign hacked emails from the server of John Podesta. Those were dropped. Again, October 7th is Putin's birthday. And if you go back in time, you can see various violent events that took place on October 7th. Also, Putin likes to mark former Soviet anniversaries, as he was a loyal servant of the former Soviet state. And the uh, 25th anniversary of Soviet collapse was, of course, when he hacked the U.S. presidential election. So I became very worried that he would do something to mark the 30th anniversary of Soviet collapse, which was at the very end of last year, December 25th, 2021. And that is, of course, also almost to the exact day, the 30th anniversary of the Ukrainian uh, pull away from the Soviet Union and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, Vladimir Putin has described these events as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And as I like to say to my students, think about that for a minute. There's a lot of competition for that title, greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And his answer is collapse of the Soviet Union. So I was very worried that he was going to mark this anniversary in some violent way. But even I have been surprised by the uh, unspeakable acts that he has committed. So I published my book uh, recently, uh, Not One Inch, America, Russia, and the Making of Post-Cold War Stalemate. I published this book to mark the 30th anniversary of Soviet collapse because I was so worried about the possibility of what we are seeing now. And I'm happy to talk more in the question and answer. In the couple of minutes I have here, let me just give you an, an all too brief summary of three of the factors that I think got us to where we are today. And I can expand more on them if desired. First is Putin's belief that Ukraine does not deserve to be a separate state or nation. The Ukrainians obviously feel very differently. They are fighting very courageously to defend their state or nation. I'd like to express my immense admiration for the courage that they and their leader, President Zelensky, have shown. But Putin has this idea that somehow Moscow should dominate the Ukrainians, should dominate the, the, the Slavic world, what he refers to as Ruski Mir. He spent two years isolated from COVID brooding about it. And so part of this was his desire to, on the anniversary of what he saw as a tragic event, the separation of Ukraine from Russia to restore that unity. So that's a one big driving factor. Another big driving factor is his concern about how the post-Cold War order evolved so much to Russia's disadvantage. It ends up a marginalized power. Uh, until recently, um, the talk in political science was about a coming Cold War with China, not a coming hot war with Russia. He felt underappreciated. He felt that he was not receiving the respect that he deserved as the leader of the only other strategic nuclear power on the planet. It's important to remember that no matter how small Russia's economy is, and I realize it's about the size of Spain, which, by the way, is not that small. What's really important is that more than 30 years after the end of the Cold War, Washington and Moscow still retain control over 90% of the world's nuclear warheads. They are the only two countries that can end civilization and most life on Earth within minutes. And I think we lost sight of that. Putin wanted to remind us of that. And third and finally, and this relates most directly to my work, there is the fight with NATO over its enlargement, which Putin feels is something that should not have happened, is a betrayal of promises. Uh, my research calls that into question. That is not in accord with the historical evidence. But Putin is not concerned about historical accuracy. He's trying to stir up emotions, and it's useful to blame NATO. And the response has been enormous. Uh, NATO has a new sense of cohesion, and we are now on the verge, remarkably, of Finnish and Swedish membership. So all of these things have come together, and Putin has decided to lash out. He's decided to lash out violently, and it has truly changed world history profoundly. So I'll stop there, but happy to answer more questions afterward. Thanks very much, Mary. Paul, I'll now turn to you. Can you give us an update on the humanitarian crisis and how it's evolved since February? Certainly, sorry, I was just unmuting. Uh, thank you again and thank you for the opportunity. So yes, I just arrived uh, back around two and a half weeks ago um, and I spent six and a half weeks. I was working in the surrounding countries, particularly the EU surrounding countries of Ukraine. Um, we all know the numbers, but it is quite extraordinary as of two or three days ago, over 6 million people have now fled uh, Ukraine proper. I'm going to concentrate on those refugees. Um, there are a couple 
unique aspects that I think we should concentrate on. Number one is that it's primarily women and children, as we know, and, and men are, are left behind to fight. Um, number two is that the EU, for the first time, implemented their uh, protection directive, temporary protection directive, which allows all Ukrainians um, fleeing the borders to be able to have access to health care, to education, um, banking, finances, and even to be able to, to work. That is extraordinary, and I think they should be congratulated. Well, I think we also must recognize that um, quite the opposite was happening with the, the migrants and uh, refugees that have been coming in since 2014, 15, particularly through uh, Greece and Italy, where they've been doing the opposite and actually not, um, not uh, allowing sound to occur. Um, and recently, the UK has just said now that uh, anyone seeking asylum that arrives in the UK will be sent to Rwanda. So I think we should all aspire, uh, in the, particularly in the EU, to provide such protection to everyone, regardless of where they're coming from. Um, some of the big issues I would add are the data that sells. Uh, we would have assumed, and when we were there, we were expecting to receive a lot of data to be able to better direct a humanitarian emergency. Whether the data is not being shared and or whether the data is not available, it's hard to, to, to know. But we have not received sufficient data to be able to actually respond. Um, Part of the reason is that, it, uh, except for Romania, everyone else is in the uh, Schengen zone, and therefore everyone is moving throughout Europe. Uh, and unless they sign up to have the temporary uh, protection, uh, their whereabouts are not officially known. So that has made it more complicated. And because the data have not been available, we've had to rely on more um, more internet, web, and uh, data data scratching to be able to really understand what is happening. Regardless, what we've seen is that the um, it's primarily, thankfully, a at least physically healthy population, and so the hospitals do not appear to be overwhelmed. Um, it's mostly wealthy, uh, sorry, wealthy, healthy women and children. Um, that being said, some of the key issues that are going to be very hard to address, but number one, two, and three really is mental health, and this has come up wherever we go. It's complicated because number in many of these countries, there just aren't enough mental health uh, professionals to begin with. Uh, and then number two is certainly they will not speak, uh, most will not speak Ukrainian or Russian. Um, and then also they don't necessarily understand the culture. There have been ways to try to address this, some innovative ways, both in the Czech Republic and in um, Slovakia, where they have developed Ukrainian medical centers where people are able to, uh, um, Ukrainians who had traditionally um, practiced and are licensed in those countries have, are starting to see Ukrainians. The EU, uh, like many, like many uh, Western countries, are highly regulated. So that's also added some challenges. Um, only EU certified meds, perhaps understandably, would be the same in, in the US and Canada and other countries. Uh, only people that are able, licensed to practice in these countries. And therefore, we need to be able to work out ways to um, send medications when they are needed um, to make sure that they're EU certified. Most of the global stockpiles um, are not, let's say many of the medicines are not EU certified. Been a lot of changes in protocols, different medications, many from Russia, again, not EU. Um, and then trying to work with the Ukrainian healthcare workers, the refugees, to be certified and to work, which is going to take time. Um, one of the, I'll end on my, my limited time, is to talk about the future. I am very concerned about what will happen in the future. Most, most of the refugees are either hosted with host families and or in hotels or in dormitories. Uh, many of these families expected to host these people for a couple of weeks, not maybe months or even a year. And as we've seen in other countries, uh, resentment may occur. And as people are no longer uh, able to host these, these people, what will happen? Where will they go? And how will that affect uh, the future of this crisis and the tensions within uh, the countries that are accepting them? Thank you. And I will stop there. Thanks very much, Paul. Before I turn to Jess, I want to remind those who are watching, please do submit questions for our experts to answer when we shift to Q&A. I see your questions coming in um, and please continue to submit them. Jess, what have been the conflict's impacts on global food systems and food security? 
Yeah, so the conflict has really uh, wreaked havoc on the global food system and really shows how fragile the global food system is. Um, Russia and Ukraine, of course, produce 30% of the wheat that's moved around the world. <clears throat> but they also produce a lot of other commodities, oil crops like safflower oil, um, etc. And they produce a lot of fertilizer. Um, Russia and Belarus produce about 40% of the potash fertilizer that's moved around the world. And this is having short-term ramifications and potential long-term ramifications for farmers who are reliant on chemical fertilizers uh, for next uh, seasonal harvests and, and, and uh, uh, putting crops down into the ground. What we're seeing now is because of the crisis on top of climate change and COVID impacts of, on the global food supply, we're seeing significant food price fluctuations and uh, food uh, prices rise across a lot of commodities. Not only wheat, not only safflower oil, but a whole range of commodities. At the same time, we're starting to see countries who are also growing some of these important crops like wheat and oil are putting export bans on. We've seen 16 countries since the end of April put export bans on some of these staple commodities. But now India, the second largest producer of wheat, has put an export ban on, uh, on wheat. Well, what does this all mean? Well, in the short term, of course, food prices rising will really hit the poorest of the poor, people living in low and middle income countries, creating social unrest, displacement, migration, as, as Paul knows well. Um, and there's an estimate uh, that just came out from the UN that this will push another 13 million people into undernourishment on top of the already 800 million people who are undernourished. This is completely catastrophic. And it just shows you a conflict between two countries, what that can do to a global food system. So there's a real call to question of why has this happened? You know, why is our global food system so heavily reliant on a couple of countries? And when there is a crisis or a conflict, why do we see such vast implications across every country in the world, including highest income countries like the United States, grappling with how they are going to ensure that they are food secure? Um, in the short term, we really need to, the top priority is humanitarian response, ensuring that people can get fast, nutritious food assistance. Um, but you know, with the fuel price increases, this is not a small task. Transportation problems will escalate. Um, but we need to ensure that we put in food assistance and food aid as soon as possible so we don't run into the situation of David Beasley, the head of the World Food Program, arguing that they're in a moment where they're taking food from the hungry and giving it to the starving. This is not a way forward for global food assistance. So we really need to ensure that countries, the global community, live up to the appeals for the $1.1 billion to help uh, Ukraine and other low-income countries. We need to completely change the ag product production systems. And this is a longer conversation, but one we need to have, one we've had for many decades, but we're really at a crossroads. Maybe we need to be less reliant on chemical fertilizers and move to more sustainable fertilizer sources, not only to avoid these kind of catastrophes, these, but for climate change purposes. Maybe we need to rethink agriculture subsidies, being less dependent on wheat, being more dependent on nutritious crops, a variety, biodiversity of crops that we have around the world. And last, we need to let trade work. The World Trade Organization has not been able to really uh, deal with export restrictions. Uh, we need to allow for, for for uh, reinforcing um, restrictions on uh, banning exports and, and have much more multilateral cooperation on the trade front. 
and I'll end there. Thank you so much, Lainey. Thanks very much, Jess. I'm now going to turn to our final panelist before we move to Q&A, and that's Nicholas. Nicholas, what's your assessment of the consequences of this war for European politics, including any impacts we may have seen from the recent French presidential election, as well as potential consequences for the European Union? Thank you, Lainey, for, for this question and for inviting me. So the background to your question, as I understand it, is that in the past decade, Putin's Russia has interfered quite directly in European politics. Amongst other things, uh, Putin gave money to right-wing nationalists in Europe, and he helped them in their ideological battle against the EU and against NATO. So given that background, uh, the war and the reports about war crime hurt European politicians who were seen as allies of Putin. The immediate effect of the war on the electoral fortunes of European nationalists uh, on the far right were mixed, however, if you think about it. Uh, I followed the French election because I'm a, I'm a dual citizen. Uh, and uh, you know, those of you who followed that too know that it diminished the uh, chances of the far right candidate, Marine Le Pen, uh, and uh, she actually lost the election. She had to, uh, to she basically got uh, the Ukraine war certainly cost her some votes because she was seen as an ally, as an ally of Putin. And in the end, Macron defeated her. However, her defeat was less dramatic than her previous defeat five years ago uh, because she was able to refocus her campaign on domestic issues, especially inflation. And she and her party remain an important force in French politics today. If you look at other elections in Europe that have happened since the war uh, in Ukraine started, for example, in Hungary, uh, the effects were, in some cases, even less decisive. In the Hungarian case, at least, it was, uh, they were less decisive. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban was able to win the election in Hungary. He ran a massive propaganda operation through government-controlled media, casting his opponent as war supporters, and he was re-elected in a landslide. So again, the immediate effects of the war in Ukraine on European politics have been mixed so far. In fact, I think the more important effects of the war in Europe are going to be deeper and more long-term. First, the war has divided the EU's far-right nationalist movement by drawing a wedge between anti-Russian nationalists and pro-Russian nationalists. For example, the Polish government is a nationalist right-wing government, but it's also anti-Russia. So its alliance with pro-Russian uh, nationalists on the right, such as Prime Minister Viktor Orban of Hungary, at the EU level, is in shambles. So that means that that's important for EU politics because much of EU politics is happening within the European Parliament or amongst uh, EU member states, amongst EU member leaders um, and member governments. And so to have uh, this division between different nationalists matters for the EU. It makes uh, the more centrist politicians more powerful. Second, the war also triggered a massive revision of European views among, about the importance of alliances and defense expenditures with, I think, very long-term implications, potentially. The first uh, effect of that, as Mary uh, highlighted, is that Finland and Sweden have now applied for NATO membership. And there is a new impetus as well for enlarging the European Union to the east of the continent. President Zelensky was told that his desire to join NATO as was really a non-starter for now, at least, so what he's done is he's applied to the European Union. EU leaders are now coming up with new initiatives for beefing up the European foreign policy and defense dimension of the European Union. And that may be the new horizon of Europe's integration for years to come. I'm happy to talk about this in the q and if, if you have any questions. From this perspective, uh, Russia's invasion, which apparently Count, counted on a weak NATO and EU response, well, that invasion clearly backfired. And I'm going to 
end here, I think. And again, happy to, to answer any questions on anything that I said that was a bit quick. Thanks very much, Nicholas. I'm now going to move to Q&A and look at questions that have been coming in from our audience, audience members. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions for our experts. Mary, I'm going to start with you. Um, and this is an amalgam of a few questions coming in. From your perspective as a historian, how might this war end? It's, I imagine, not as simple as one side wins and one side loses. Yeah, so let me, uh, I liken situations like this to quote a Polish writer who won the Nobel Prize in literature, Wisława Szymborska. My apologies to great questions for small answers. It's hard to know how this war will end. I think it's also important to understand there's a chance it may not end. It may turn into a frozen conflict. There are a number of those. Putin created one in Georgia in 2008. Technically, the Korean War from the 1950s hasn't ended. So we may be in it for the long haul and uh, an, an end may not really accurately describe what may happen. What is, I think, likely to happen, although not the only possible outcome by a long shot, is that there will be a frozen conflict with Russia having de facto taken control of more of the Eastern region, more of the land between the Eastern regions of Ukraine and Crimea. But Ukraine will continue to exist as an independent nation state, which is clearly not what Putin wanted and not what Russia wanted. So that, I think, is probably a likely outcome. Sadly, there are other outcomes. Uh, Putin still has many means of escalation at his disposal. I mentioned before that Russia and the United States still control more than 90 percent of the world's nuclear warheads. Uh, since the end of the Cold War, they still have those. They, the number has been reduced, but they have not gone away. And I published a New York Times op-ed where I talked about the dangers that those would involve for the world. We still have these weapons, but we don't have the guardrails that we used to have in the form of arms control agreements. There is currently only one arms control agreement that binds both Washington and Moscow. It's due to expire, and I'm not holding my breath for a possibility of renewal. So that means the two strategic nuclear powers will be completely unconstrained in a couple of years, and that's very scary. So obviously the worst case scenario would be a strategic nuclear exchange, which would be a civilization ending event, would end most life on earth. But there are things below that. There is the use of tactical nuclear weapons, which Putin could do. There's the use of chemical or biological weapons, which he could do. There would be radiological warfare, which would be something we really, which is really scary to me, we started seeing happen. So in other words, attacking nuclear power stations in a knowingly unsafe way that could release radiological hazards in other words, you know, radioactive poisoning, even if you don't actually set off a weapon. Uh, there's a huge possibility for mistake. Uh, this, war, this war is happening on the border of NATO countries. If something spills over, it could be terrible. So I, we're, we're not out of the woods in any way. It's not clear how or if it's going to end. And there are a lot of dangers. Uh, I do hope it, under the circumstances, if it could grind to a conflict where there's a lower level of violence, I think that would still be tragic, but that would be better than many of the alternatives. Thanks, Mary. Paul, question for you. We've we've seen the targeting of healthcare facilities by the Russian army. What do you see as the impact of that for the longer term recovery of Ukrainian infrastructure and especially delivery of healthcare? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> these, I mean, these these deliberate targeting, of course, are against uh, international humanitarian law, and it's going to be easier to recover. I'm, I'm less concerned about the destruction of those current facilities as I am about what their aims are and what they're meant to be, which is to um, destroy people's people's morale and then to have people move and move out, which is one of Putin's aims is to overwhelm Europe with the refugees. And so by deliberately targeting these facilities as uh, the Russians have in, in Syria um, con uh, consistently, uh, and as is happening in Yemen, is is a change in the way war is being fought, and I mean the implications are are much beyond just the issues of of recovery. The Ukrainian government is already working, and and um, you know what is interesting is that despite all of this, the Ukrainian government not only exists but is functioning and is already making plans for post recovery. And I'm confident that they'll be receiving a lot of uh, aid when when that is possible. Thanks, Paul. 
Nicholas, question for you to pick up on your opening remarks. Could you speak more about the future of EU defense and security integration? Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, a tricky question because, again, you know, the future is unknown. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think what uh, was missing in the uh, in the, the the debate on uh, defense and security until very recently was outside pressure for the Europeans to feel that they really needed to beef up uh, what is called the European defense and, and foreign policy, which has been around you know, since the 1990s. So it's not a new thing. But uh, for, uh, for a while, uh, you know, there was no initiative coming in because there was no sense of threat. Now, this has obviously changed in the past couple of months. And uh, what we're going to see, I think, is uh, both initiatives to uh, go to the recommended threshold of 2% of defense expenditures in all the NATO member countries. Uh, and that's going to, you know, that's something that uh, the member countries can, can go to uh, in relatively short order, and that's important, especially for a country like Germany, which was pretty far from, from that threshold. And then at the level of the EU itself, the, the European Union, uh, what there could be is an initiative to develop what has often been called the European pillar of NATO. There was a sense um, that uh, for a long time that, that the EU needed to have its independent uh, defense system, it's independent foreign policy, independent from the United States, of course, uh, and uh, that may uh, become more of a, uh, of a drive within Europe, because even though right now the relationship with the U.S. is pretty good with Biden, uh, all the European leaders remember that this wasn't the case under Donald Trump, and so they are concerned that if this had happened, uh, you know, only at, uh, like about, about a year ago, two years ago, I guess, uh, the, the uh, level of support from the United States might have been much less than it has been under Biden. So they want to preempt that. And a good way of preempting that is to build a, a, an independent defense and foreign policy capability uh, at the EU level. Thanks, Nicholas. Mary, question for you. Are things more dangerous when it appears that the Russian military is losing or when the media portrays it that way? Hmm. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but uh, certainly if Putin is feeling cornered and as if he has no way out, then obviously there's a danger that he could lash out. There is a, a famous saying from the uh, military strategist Sun Tzu, you should build your enemy a golden bridge to retreat across. Many people have been quoting this re recently and, and with good reason, it's good advice. So I am no fan of Putin. I have described him in print as a grim and murderous leader many years ago and have seen nothing to change my mind. But the problem is you don't make peace with your friends, you make them with your enemies. And so in the interest of saving Ukrainian lives, uh, I think it is important to at least verbally provide Putin with the sense that he could, if not win, emerge saving face. So in other words, at least rhetorically, try you know, not to uh, really double down on a narrative of Russia losing. Again, this is how, separately from how I would feel about emotionally, this is purely a tactical a set of suggestions in the interest of saving Ukrainian lives. So diplomats need to find a way to work with Russia to end this conflict because it is truly tragic and unspeakable. The kinds of things we're seeing out of Bucha, you know, maternity wards being bombed. It's, you know, it's really, it's truly horrific. It, it needs to end. It needs to get off of the plane of violence and come down somehow to the level of contentious political relations as opposed to violence. Uh, the, um, obviously, you know, we have a free media, so the media is going to portray what it, what it wants to portray. And, and that's a wonderful thing that we have a free media and many journalists are working in Ukraine very bravely. Some are losing their lives. Uh, but at the diplomatic level, it's important as much as, you know, as, as, as stomach turning as what Putin is doing, it's important to keep lines of communication open because just to repeat, you don't make peace with your friends, you make peace with your enemies. And we, we very much need peace in Ukraine. 
Thanks, Mary. Paul, question for you. What do we know about sexual violence within this humanitarian crisis? Yeah, um, excellent and important question. Um, we know that it is occurring, or at least it's certainly been uh, reported quite widely. And um, one of the problems has been and, and remains trying to document it, but more importantly, trying to make sure that the the women, men, and children that are, are targeted um, have access. That's going to be more difficult. Most of the sexual violence is occurring in, let's say rape in many situations, is occurring inside Ukraine by, uh, by Russian forces. However, um, we also have to be worried about um, both trafficking of women within the EU and with women and children who are uh, living with host families, where also this may be occurring. It's like in every culture, it is underreported. And um, we, WHO, we are working with governments and others to ensure that referral pathways are available. Um, lastly, just to say that we concentrate sometimes on the medical, but by far the most important component will be working with the communities to make sure that um, that they have the the comfort and sustenance to be able to help people respond and that they do have access to um, to care when needed. Over. Thanks, Paul. Jess, question for you. Which regions of the world are most likely to face the most severe food security issues in the coming months? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, of course, low-income countries are really going to struggle, particularly those countries that are very reliant on the imports of many different food commodities. Um, all eyes are on West Africa, uh, Central Africa at the moment. And we know there's certain countries that are very much reliant on certain food commodities coming from uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh will be significantly impacted by the oil issues, uh, safflower oil, palm oil, soy oil. Um, <clears throat> Egypt, about 80% of their wheat comes from Ukraine and Russia. That's pushing up prices of bread by 25, 30% already, and that will continue. Um, and of course, uh, Central Asian countries like Mongolia, uh, North Africa, Egypt, Sudan um, will all be impacted. And when poor people, when food prices go up, poor people will um, reduce what they eat. They'll reduce the quality of the kinds of foods that they can get access to. So this is significantly detrimental, not only for short term food security, for already food insecure countries, but the long-term implications for nutrition and human health compounded with COVID are, are really catastrophic. And the gains that the nutrition and food security global community have made to try to reduce hunger over the last several decades are quickly uh, reversing, unfortunately. But all eyes right now are on, on these countries that are highly uh, dependent on imports of foods and, and those countries like West Africa, um, Central Africa, North Africa that are, are very dependent on, on the wheat that's coming from Ukraine and Russia. Thanks, Jess. Mary, question for you. How can policymakers and diplomats strike some kind of a balance between giving Putin an off-ramp without rewarding him for his crimes? Yeah, that's uh, really the challenge. I would also add, uh, without also on the flip side, without being so confrontational that we cause an escalation of the conflict, it's a it's a really hugely difficult challenge. Fortunately, we have experience with this kind of challenge. It was called the Cold War. Uh, I'm a historian of the Cold War, so I would say that. And we spent you know the better part of four decades finding a way to push back against the Soviet Union, but not push the conflict over into the nuclear realm. And we essentially need those skills again. I was talking to a, an American diplomat uh, about two weeks ago and he said, you know, he was an older man who had had a long career dealing with the Soviets. And he said, you know, I spent a lot of hours of my life sitting in rooms with Russians who I'm pretty sure were lying to me. But 
over the years, the contacts did bring things. We negotiated arms control agreements. We put guardrails together. We developed, you know, not good relations, but at least bad relations. One of the things that's really frightening to me now is just how little dialogue there is. The there during the um, during the 1990s, early 2000s, a whole host of military to military contacts developed. Those have ended. Uh, the both Russia and the United States have closed consulates, have pulled back diplomatic staff. They're down to bare bones staffs in respect in their respective host countries. Uh, arms control agreements have basically gone completely away. In other words, the world's two most powerful countries in, in, in military terms are operating essentially in isolation of each other. And just that alone is dangerous because a mistake could really spiral out of control. So I think it's important to we're moving to move from a situation of essentially having no relations with Moscow to having bad relations with Moscow. I'm under no delusion that this will suddenly mean everything will be better, but we, we do need to keep lines of dialogue open. We need to find something that Putin can define as victory. He seems to be reducing that, right? Obviously, plan A was shock and awe, take over the whole country, topple Zelensky, take over Ukraine. That didn't work. And then plan B was to seize major cities. That didn't work. So now they're on to plan C, which is take a bit more of the east, which they held already anyway, in the land bridge to Crimea. Perhaps there's a, you know, an, end, a, an end game there where, you know, although it's not something everyone's going to want, we, it would at least be acceptable to Putin and we can back down from this level of intense violence and atrocity that we're seeing. So if I were a diplomat, I would you know, currently be trying to talk in a very sober way uh, about finding that end state in, um, you know, finding how to achieve that end state. Thanks, Mary. And Nicholas, next question is coming to you. But before I ask it, I, I do want to remind those who are watching, we have about 15 minutes left, we can still take your questions as they come in, and we have plenty more to, um, to get through now. So Nicholas, how likely is Ukraine to become an EU member? And how long might that process take? Nicholas, I think that, that you're uh, muted. Uh, the answer to your first question is very likely because I think everybody in the European Union recognizes that Ukraine is a European country and that it has a vocation of becoming an EU member state. But the second question is much more difficult. Uh, in order to become a member state of the European Union, uh, it, it, you know, it takes... Uh, abiding by certain conditions that are called the Copenhagen criteria. Uh, so there's a process that takes, uh, in some cases, I mean, it has taken other European countries in, uh, in Eastern and Central Europe decades, literally, to become members of the European Union. You know, from, from the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall in the late 1980s uh, to 2004 and 2007, when the first uh, the first members of the previous Soviet bloc were admitted into the EU. It has taken basically, you know, 15 years. Uh, President Macron said it would take decades, uh, several decades. Um, I mean, it, it reflects the fact that Ukraine is uh, much less developed economically than uh, the EU, and also the fact that. Um, you know, the, the Ukraine, Ukraine is a country that has a lot of corruption, uh, in which the rule of law is not nearly as well established as in many countries, in many existing member states of the European Union. And so, uh, and, and that is without even discussing the, you know, some misgivings that European populations in particular have towards admitting a new country in the in the east of the European Union, there are uh, European there are members. I mean, significant sections of, segments of the voting public who would be against admitting uh, the Ukrainians into the European Union. So all that means that the prospect of admitting Ukraine into the EU is not for tomorrow, and it's not for the day after tomorrow. Thanks, Nicholas. Paul, a question for you. At this point, what do we know about how much aid is reaching those within Ukraine? In other words, those who are internally displaced? It, it 
varies by um, by where they are, of course. And so um, aid is coming in, streaming in um, in many settings. But we we, as I mentioned, some of the we've had to resort to different sort of uh, methods to be able to get certain information. One of them is um, crowdsourcing, and we. There was a company that was working previously within the Ukraine uh, related to COVID, COVID, and what we've seen now is since the war, asking the same sort of answers, it's moved from um, cost of healthcare to actually now the its basic provision of getting medications and getting um, some services. So we know that there's been a shift already, and it it will dramatically be different according to firstly the south and the east compared to what's happening both in uh, in Kyiv and Lviv. Um, and on top of that, we have, besides the care that's getting in, we um, have a serious issue of trauma and, and sufficient beds for um, people that are getting, uh, the soldiers that are, are getting uh, hit by the, by the missiles. And so we do know that ICRC, Metzel Sans Frontières and others are there and trying to support but in the areas where it's very, very insecure, it's primarily the, the Ukrainian uh, military and who are supporting. Thanks, Paul. Jess, question for you. You've written about and you mentioned in your opening remarks how this ongoing war demonstrates need for greater diversification in the global food supply. Can you say more about what's needed in that regard? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and you know, really, the, the war has shown that the way our agriculture systems have been historically funded and uh, determined um, is flawed. Um, rice, corn, and wheat have come to dominate agriculture. You know, we have something like 390,000 different kinds of foods we could grow. Um, about 6,000 have been, have been grown throughout history, but only 12 uh, animal species and crops dominate 75% of the arable land. 50% of that is rice, maize, and wheat. So we have a real homogenization of our agriculture system that puts us at huge risk when we think about climate, when we think about conflicts. Um, so something's got to give, something has to change. And one of the big uh, things to change are farm subsidies and the research and development R&D um, in agriculture dependent countries. How can we shift the subsidies away from these three staple crops that aren't that nutritious? They really just provide calories, not really nutritious calories. How can we shift that towards a more diverse food basket, reducing risk uh, with climate change shocks and, and towards a whole variety of foods, fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes, other staple crops that are traditionally still used. So we really need to do a reshifting of agriculture subsidies. And that's not an easy lift. Um, these are very entrenched policies that many farmers are dependent on now. But maybe now is the time to make some shifts across the world towards diversifying our agriculture system to lessen risks. And, and the conflict in Ukraine and Russia just uh, you know, exacerbates this longstanding homogenization issue that agriculture has perpetuated. Thanks, Jess. Mary, getting several questions asking for your historian's eye. So I'm, I'm going to do my, my best to combine them into one. The, the gist is, looking back, what, if anything, could have been done by the West over the course of the 2000s that would have led us to a different place from where we are today? Yeah, that's a great question, because that's actually the question I, I deal with in my book, Not One Inch. So I'd like to refer your listeners who want more details than I can provide in the short time, time here to, to the book. The uh, short answer, and my, any, if I have any students in the audience, they'll groan when they hear this because they've heard me say it before. The short answer is that as a historian, the only phenomenon that I have never observed is monocausality, monocausality important events happen for multiple reasons. So there's no, as far as I can tell, simple solution where you say, if I had thrown this light switch differently, then the future would be fine. 
There are, however, obvious places where the Russian-American relationship started deteriorating. That relationship, and, and to be precise, it, the cooperation in the realm of strategic nuclear disarmament that arose in the 90s after the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the Soviet Union, the collapse of Soviet, uh, the Soviet empire in essence, that cooperation was hugely important, not just for Russia and America, not just for Europe, but for the world. It made the world a safer place. And as I've said, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Vladimir Putin, but keeping cooperation going with Russia is in the interest of human survival, whether we like Putin or not. And so in my book, I look at how that relationship, which was so promising in the 1990s, started to disintegrate. And it's clear that there was agency on both sides, on the sides of both the Russians and the Americans. On the Russian side, uh, the president of the first, the first president of independent Russia, who, by the way, was the first elected Russian president. Russia became an imperfect democracy, but it did become a democracy. It did have free elections. And our democracy is hardly perfect. So I, I believe that Russia is capable of being a democratic country because it was. There's been, to my eyes, a very discouraging conversation recently about how, oh, this always had to happen. Russians always end up under a dictator. They always end up invading their neighbors. I, I don't agree with that. I don't believe in that kind of determinism. I did see, however, that Boris Yeltsin, who was a Democrat and was elected, made a tragic series of self-harming choices. They basically boiled down to deciding to use bloodshed against his political opponents. So in October 1993, for example, he had tanks fire on his own parliament. And more importantly, in December of 1994, he started a bloody war in the Chechen region that wanted to break away, but that he viewed as part of Russia. Rather than trying to negotiate these things on a political level, he decided to descend into violence. He also presided over uh, the de-democratization of Russia after it democratized and the spread of immense corruption throughout Russia. And so as all of this happened, the West got more and more nervous about being a partner to Russia. And then there were problems on the Western side as well, which as I talk about in my book, there was a real sense of triumphalism, a real sense that, that uh, you know, Russia could be ignored, it was a broken power. And you know, that, that may have been true for a short time, but Russia is the largest country on earth by landmass. As I've already said multiple times, the only other country that can end life on earth. It, it doesn't make any sense to ignore Russia, whether you like Putin or Russian leaders or not. Russia is the biggest country in Europe. It has the biggest military in Europe. And you need to define a place or a stake for Russia in Europe if you're going to have long-term peace. And there was, I believe, an opportunity to do that. There was a, a, I believe, very sensible policy initiative called the Partnership for Peace that actually was policy. This is not a counterfactual. This actually started happening and was working. And I think if we tried to stick with that, tried to stick more with that attitude of maintaining cooperation and partnership, we could perhaps have gotten onto a less dark timeline. I don't think that we would be in a situation of wine and roses with Moscow, but the timeline that we are actually on is, is really very, very dark. And so I go through that in, in a great detail in my book. So that, that's a great question. That really is the question that I was asking in my book, not when it's. Thanks, Mary. Paul, as, as we think about this protracted conflict evolving, what are the humanitarian needs or challenges that you're most concerned about? Um, well, if we divide it within what's happening with Ukraine and then the, the refugees outside, within Ukraine, it's still an incredibly acute situation. So we're worried about um, the direct and then the indirect effects of the conflict. The direct effect, effects, of course, everyone is aware of, but the indirect effects of not getting sufficient medications in certain areas, not being able to see doctors, uh, maternal child health um, are, going to, are, are serious and will, will remain serious. Um, and as well as the mental health issues. Outside of, of Ukraine, um, there are many, many concerns, uh, including, as, as I mentioned, the issue of what will happen in the longer term. But even in the short term, um, for example, vaccinations are quite different and uh, amongst the Ukrainians and some of the other uh, Euro countries in the EU. So those concerns about epidemics and, and vaccine preventable diseases, uh, COVID is still uh, an issue that still should be very, uh, very evident to, to all of us uh, in the field, on the border, speaking with people. COVID was not a concern for, understandably, perhaps for the Ukrainians coming over. So although 
uh, vaccines and uh, testing was free, they were not being utilized. And, and Ukraine is traditionally a vaccine hesitant uh, or a vaccine hesitant people. So these are just a couple of the, the big issues. Um, I'll end just by saying both in Ukraine proper and in uh, the EU itself, as well as countries like Moldova, we'll really have to think about health systems and health systems financing to be able to address this massive magnitude of people that are now within Europe and, and using all of these um, systems for the long run. Thanks, Paul. And Mary, I'm going to circle back to, to you. So in the last few days, we've seen the leaders of both Finland and Sweden indicate that they do wish to become NATO members. How significant is that development when you think about the context of NATO's post-Cold War expansion? This is a hugely significant development, and it simply would um, not be happening if Putin had not invaded Ukraine. So there was a, a joke meme circulating that Putin has won NATO's Salesman of the Year award. It's uh, uh, obviously it's a tragic situation, so you have to be careful with using humor, but I think that that is accurate. Finland and Sweden have long been either neutral or non-aligned. In Sweden, they like to say, we haven't fought a war in 200 years, and now they are becoming part of NATO. And this is significant on every possible level. It's significant politically, it's hugely significant militarily, and it's significant in terms of the message it sends. In the brief time that I have, let me just talk a little bit about why it's significant militarily, although this by far, that's far from the only way it's significant. NATO has already expanded to the Baltics. In other words, it has, it has already given Article 5 to the Baltic states. Article 5 is the heart of the North Atlantic Treaty. It's the article that says any member state will treat an attack on itself as an attack on all. It is one of the strongest military guarantees that has ever existed, and 30 countries have it currently. Now, when NATO was expanding in the 1990s, and I'm paraphrasing here, but again, the details are in my book, not one inch. Uh, there were a number of critics who said, you know, we, we have only the highest respect for the Baltics, but they're almost indefensible without Finland and Sweden being members because they are basically surrounded by Russia on all sides except for a narrow land bridge. And that is you know, a, a region that Russia could easily seal off in the event of war. In fact, in 2016, the think tank RAND did a war game simulating Russian military action in the Baltics. And the question was, how long would it take Russia to take over the territory of the Baltics? And the answer was measured in hours. Now, obviously, we've seen in Ukraine that the Russian military has underperformed its, uh, according to expectations. It has not been nearly as effective as we thought, but it is, it is still a very large and effective army. And the Baltics, it may not be ours, but they would be under very, very serious threat. But if you add in military terms, both Finland and Sweden, and I would encourage uh, your listeners to Google a map of the Baltic Sea while I'm talking, you'll see what I mean. As soon as you add Finland and Sweden, suddenly you turn the Baltic Sea into a NATO lake, you gain strategic defense in depth, uh, you gain greatly expanded amphibious possibilities, the Baltics start to look like defensible territory. And under the circumstances, that's a very good thing because we have already given them Article 5. And what people were saying at the time uh, about expanding to the Baltics is maybe it's not such a good idea to give out Article 5 guarantees on the assumption that we will never have to live up to them because it would be very, very difficult to live up to Article 5 guarantees just in a, in a tactical sense, militarily, to this tiny bit of territory that's all but entirely cut off except for a tiny land bridge. There's this piece of Russia called Kaliningrad, which is non-contiguous with the rest, rest of Russia, but heavily armed. And you can bet that if there is war, Russia will make Kaliningrad contiguous with its territory and cut the Baltics off entirely. So under the circumstances, this is a very positive development militarily and also for other reasons. Thanks, Mary. And with that, you'll have the last word because we're just about at time. So I'd like to thank Mary Surratt, Paul Spiegel, Jess Fanzo, and Nicholas Jabko for joining me today. And I'd also like to give a big thank you to everyone who attended this briefing, and especially to those who submitted questions for our experts to answer. A recording of this event will be made available on this website. Today's panelists, together with other faculty from across Johns Hopkins University, will continue to analyze the wide-ranging consequences of the war in Ukraine. Thank you again for joining today's briefing. Thank you.